Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. Fantastic to uh, be here with uh, Dia. I was very relieved that uh, Chashti emphasized I'm the dialogue facilitator because otherwise you could have thought that I was the angry man. <laughs> <laughs> but of course, we are talking about issues here that make us angry, <clears throat> that uh, challenges our understanding. Why do these sorts of things happen? And there are few who can guide us better than the always curious, always questioning Dia Khan. So I'll just say a few words about you before we see a trailer of your newest film, which is on the exact topic of yeah. today's conversation. Yeah. Uh, for those of you who are not from Norway, you may not know that we have a conception in Norway that we uh, put a lot of weight on, namely to be a Norgesven. <laughs> Norgesven simply means a well-known person who knows where Norway is. <laughs> and maybe even comes here to visit. You know, old rock bands like uh, Toto and Smokey, when they come here, they are Norges. And Dia mm. is much more than that because she's born in Norway. Yeah. Grew up in Lombardsete Torsen here in this city. I guess when you come back now, you miss the weather? Uh, terribly, oh, yes. Oh, terribly. Yes, yes. yes. So, of course. You are an <laughs> award-winning filmmaker. You are also a singer and musician. You've uh, spent your life telling stories, yeah. your own and others. And that is, of course, <clears throat> what you also do in this latest film called Behind the Rage. So before we start the actual conversation, where we'll also have more guests on our stage, we'll now see a short trailer for this movie that I hope all of us will uh, see very soon. This is the first time in my life I ever stopped to look at myself for a long time in the mirror. And it was like, damn, I took a woman's life, and that's the hardest thing to live with, is that I killed the woman. I would uh, choke her. Um, I would push her down. I would hold her down. I was addicted to that dominance. I've lied to her. I've spit on her. I have grabbed by the neck, too, yes. I pushed her down to the dirt, and I stomped on her hand. I remember cornering that girl, and I physically beat the shit out of her. My name is Dia Khan. I'm a filmmaker and activist. I've been fighting violence against women for the past 15 years. I wanted to meet the men who abuse their loved ones. I wanted to find out why violence against women happens and how we can stop it. I never cared. It was about me. I'm in my house, so nobody's really going to tell me anything. It feels like America's phrase, land of the free. There's a greater consequence in the United States for killing a bald eagle than there is for assaulting your wife. Y'all say y'all love us. Y'all say y'all want to take care of us. But this is what you do. Why are you doing what you do? I'm sorry. I know. Five days before our wedding, his hands were around my neck, and he squeezed really tightly, and he used the chokehold to hit my head up against the wall. Five days later, I put on my mother's wedding gown, and I married him. And then he beat me twice more on our honeymoon. He was abusing me very regularly, strangling me, pushing me downstairs, beating me up. Eventually, Leslie escaped her husband. Like Angela, she's now trying to understand why men beat the women they claim to love. Although it's very important to focus on victims and survivors of abuse and get us the support we need, we are never going to end violence against women unless we help men. You can't help an abuser by saying you're evil. You have to come at them from the point of trying to gradually get them to see that they were victims themselves and that they're acting out of that kind of pain and rage. Not only did I become obsessive, I became a, a stalker. That led up to the morning that it, I actually did what I did. When I went there on, on September the 19th, 
It was around 6 o'clock in the morning. And I went there, and I was so angry. And I did not know I, to the extent of how bad I reacted until I seen the autopsy report. When I read the autopsy, I didn't know that I had stabbed her multiple times, and it was one fatal fatal uh, blow, and, and it was at the base of her neck. That was a fatal blow. That was that, and but I didn't know that it was thirteen times because I was so far in a rage that it did it. I and I jumped up and I ran. And, and, um, and she had died with her friend's mother trying to save her. That's what shame feels like, looking at itself in the mirror and all you see is a monster. And you hate what you see. I hated me so much. When this film premiered on British TV, the Times of London gave it a five-star review. And I'd just like to read what Often Poston wrote, Jette Lisbon. There are many documentaries who seek out dangerous and inaccessible environments to convey something raw and mind-boggling but no one does it exactly like Norwegian British Diachan. She's up there in a class of her own, close to Louis Thoreau, uh, Thoreau and, and Errol Morris. You obviously managed to tell some stories, but please tell us, what did you learn from these stories? When you ask yourself the question, why do these things happen? Yeah. Not just in the US, not <clears throat> just in Russia, all over the world, yeah, yeah. hear these sorts of stories, please. Yeah, it's really it's, uh, interesting to see the clip again, because, I mean, obviously I've seen it a thousand times, but just seeing it again, it just, every time, it, it bothers me, like I get like a visceral reaction to it. Um, you're absolutely right. You know, when it comes to violence against women, there is not one country that can put its hand up and say, you know what, we don't do this anymore. We have evolved past it, we have figured this out, and we no longer do this, including this country, you know, which is one of the best countries to be a woman, but that door closes and women still suffer at the hands of their, their partners mm -hmm. or, or their family members. So what did I learn? Um, I learned some of what uh, Leslie, one of, the, one of the survivor was saying, which is in order for somebody to hurt the person that they say they love, something has been taken from them mm. as well. Mm. And when I listen to most of these guys' stories, their own childhoods, they had suffered very severe traumas or they have suffered uh, neglect or abuse or sexual violence themselves, or they had witnessed their mother mm. being beaten by their father. Mm. And what was interesting for me when I tried to understand, well, but wouldn't that make you sympathize with your mother? Why, why would you then repeat that same thing that you were so terrified of when you were a little boy? And what was interesting is that many of them, in order to survive it themselves, you don't want to, you don't want to be the person who's the weakest person being hit. Yeah. You'd rather be the person who's hitting because at least you have something. At least you have some control, you have some power. So interestingly, some of the, not all children obviously, because I also interviewed another man whose mother was beaten as, when he was young, and he's become the opposite. He's become, you know, he works for women and has built a woman's shelter and all of that. So uh, what I've learned is that it comes from trauma, trauma begets more trauma. Uh, but, so there is that personal side of it, but it also comes from our culture. Yeah. It comes from our society. It doesn't, you know, th these types of behaviors don't just grow in a vacuum. We have to have a society that to some conscious or unconscious level says, ah, maybe it's okay. Maybe it's just, maybe men are just more violent. Maybe it's just, you know, maybe he didn't know how to react and maybe, maybe you did something. I mean, I think in very many countries, maybe not as much in Norway, but a lot of people ask the wrong questions when they're looking at this issue. They say, why, does she, why doesn't she leave him? Why is she with a man like that? Why isn't she reporting him? Why does she keep going back? Rather than saying, 
why does he hit? I've had so many arguments with my feminist friends, many of them who run women's shelters. And, and I'm like, look, how many women are we going to hide? How many women can we keep away from an abuser? He goes on to the next one, and the next, and the next, and the next. One can go to crisis center, what about the next one? I know people in my own extended family where this has happened. So, and his violence typically gets worse and worse and worse in each relationship. So at some point, we have to turn the camera and the, the, the sense of responsibility on the behavior of the person who is using the violence itself. We should, of course, support women. We should believe women. We should make them safe and their kids safe instantly. However, longer term, we have to interrupt the behavior itself. Mm -hmm. uh, and mm -hmm. that can only yeah. happen by engaging with them, yeah. I think. A bit more than five years ago, I was actually in this room with Dennis McQuaig, oh, yeah. the Nobel oh, laureate, yeah. who uh, was meeting with fifth graders. Yeah. It's one of the things that we do during the Nobel days. Yeah. And he clearly expressed the view that this is the audience that we really need to talk to. Absolutely. Because as you say, trauma builds on trauma. Yeah. Violence creates more violence. So yeah. in some way or another, yeah. we have to talk about this also early in life. To we do. Boys, what does it mean to be a boy? So as an activist, what would you say that we as a society or as individuals yeah. can do more of to get these conversations started earlier in life? Yeah, I, I think it's a mixture of responses. It's, it's obviously a complicated mix of, of all kinds of dynamics that have to be considered. But first and foremost, we have to make women safe. So we have to protect women and we have to make sure that they have access to all the support and all the services that they need yeah. if they are at risk or if they've already been exposed to violence and their kids. So there is that. And then I think we need to have perpetrator programs that are mandated. Mm -hmm. I don't think that they can be. Personally, I... I, I I'm all for free will, but this is one of the areas where I think that we have to mandate it through the courts. Mm -hmm. If somebody has proven that they are a risk to somebody else, they have to go through uh, a sort of de-radicalization, if we call it, want to call it that, uh, and, and work on the, their, their violent tendencies and their worldview. Um, and then longer societal, a longer view, is we have to start having these conversations early. We have to have them in schools. We have to have them in our homes. We have to talk about what healthy relationships are like. Mm -hmm. What does it mean to be a human being, to have a relationship with yourself that is healthy? What does it mean to have a relationship with somebody else that is healthy, that is respectful? What is consent? What is my bodily autonomy? What is your bodily autonomy? We are seeing, I spoke to so many of these guys and so many of them talked about choking women. And then I'd ask them, How, what is this choking thing about? And a lot of it is spilled over from a lot of the porn that they're watching. A lot of the porn that our young boys have access to has become so violent and so brutal that a natural part of the menu of having intimate you know, relationship with, with, with a girl is choking, mm -hmm. you know? And, that's, and, it's, and some girls think that that's also a natural part of what you're supposed to do. So I think we need to have these conversations about sex, about consent, about your body, but also about your mentality and your view of where you place yourself and where you place other human beings, your dignity, your humanity, and somebody else's, and how that doesn't happen. It doesn't have to happen at the expense of each other. It can happen both at the same time. We can, happen, we can keep two thoughts and support two people at one time. So I think we have to talk about masculinity. What does it mean to be a man? I don't use the term toxic masculinity. I think that's a, that's a toxic term. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think masculinity and what is manhood and being a man and being a boy, what does that actually mean? Mm -hmm. In a society, and I know we'll talk about this more later, so I don't need to talk about it mm -hmm. now, but uh, I think it's absolutely crucial. And we have to have those conversations. Mm -hmm. And we have to have them early because our young people are looking for answers. And if we don't engage with them, they will go and they will find the wrong answers online yeah. or from yeah. people, personalities online that, mm -hmm. that are more interested in making money from our kids' confusion and legitimate questions that they have. Yeah. So yeah. It's, it speaks of our failure, yeah. uh, I think. Mm -hmm. I'm having quite a weekend because I had a chance <laughs> to be with Dia yesterday as well. It's why uh, I've when lost we, my voice. He made me talk too much. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's wonderful. It's wonderful because I learn a lot, but also because I had the honor yesterday of um, giving you an award on behalf of a committee I'm part of, which uh, is named after Blanche Mayor, 
uh, a Hungarian lady who survived Auschwitz and who told the story afterwards and who had the motto that we cannot change the past, but we can change the future. Yeah. And I think your way of confronting these issues is so much in keeping with her spirit and mm. we have to dare to talk about it. And I remember we ended the evening last night at the dinner quoting uh, an American called Fred Rogers, who was oh, yeah. a uh, TV personality <laughs> on American children's TV, who said that uh, everything mentionable is manageable. It sure is. We have to find the words to talk about these things. Yeah. Now, I will invite up another of my favorites here. I'm <laughs> fortunate to be with people I really want to talk to, and it's just a bonus that all of you are here as well. Um, she is the former deputy mayor of Oslo. She is currently a member of parliament and also a very uh, brave voice in uh, Norway. We all know her just as Kamsi, so normally we just say that. And Kamsi Blanatman, uh, originally from Sri Lanka, but truly Norwegian. Here you are, come on up. <laughs> now, <clears throat> Dia's film is uh, set outside of Norway. Mm -hmm. So we meet these sorts of things that we hear about in American society, and then suddenly we realize over the last few weeks, goodness, what is happening here in Norway? Individual instances, but also questions having to do with culture show that this is something, something that's far away, and I think Dia put it well. We think of Norway as a safe and good country for women to live in, and then these sorts of things happen. And there was, as many of you will know, a murder at uh, Elverum, where you knew the uh, victim, who was a victim of exactly what we're talking about here. So how do you feel the situation is in Norway now on exactly these issues of male rage and uh, women's safety? What I feel about women's safety in Norway? <laughs> um, actually, I've been working with this topic for the last couple of years in the parliament, and uh, uh, it's, it's, not a, it's not a pretty... Uh, scene actually, and we don't talk enough about it. So you can also say that the silver lining with all these happenings last weeks uh, to put all of these uh, things on the mainstream media all the time and let people talk about it, have these conversations, I think that's the silver lining we're getting out of this because this topic does not get enough uh, attention in the media, uh, in the debate. Mm. Um, and, and it's because I think it still is a private matter. Yeah. Whatever happens in the house next door, it's not your problem. And many people does not uh, use their... Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, the Norwegian word was... I don't know what well, that yeah. means. The uh, duty not to... Uh, duty to... Um, uh, yeah, to report. Uh, yeah, yes. oh, yeah, now, now yeah. Thank you. Yeah, <laughs> Sorry. Report. Thank you. It's good to have a helpful audience. Please. Yeah. <laughs> but, but the duty to, uh, to yeah. report is yeah. actually a, by law. Mm. It's an individual uh, duty, mm. and, and uh, not enough people are actually using it. Mm. And, uh, and it's a problem, and I think it it's connects with the, uh, the, the structural situation that it's still a, f a family and a private matter. Mm. So you don't yeah. uh, intervene. Do you recognize that as a problem, that people simply don't say, even if they know these things are going on? I, I think so. I think it also depends from community to community. So I think, you know, certain minority communities, because, you know, so I, I spoke with an African-American man who, in the film, and he was like, look, I feel so marginalized in every other sphere of my life. Mm. And then I close that door and I want to be the king somewhere. Mm. I, I want to matter somewhere. Mm. And so, and he said, and I'm sorry to say it, but you know, so my wife gets to bear the brunt of that. Mm. But a lot of people wouldn't want to interfere mm. in certain communities because they don't want to be seen as racist or they don't want to be seen as insensitive. Maybe this is their culture. It is nobody's culture. Mm. It's not my culture to be beaten or to be cut or to be raped or any of that. Mm. So that needs to be put somewhere else. I am entitled to the same rights and same protections as any other woman or any other man walking outside here. So I think that's something that's important. I think there's something else that's really important to also talk about is there is actually a lot of shame on the part of the perpetrators, yeah. on the men who do this. Mm -hmm. It was so hard for me to find men willing to speak to me on camera. 
it's, it's, uh, finally, when I found some, they were like, can you just show my hands or can you just make me a silhouette? And I said, no, I have to see you. And people have to see you, that you are just a person. Mm -hmm. You are not like some, some per, you know, monster with horns that dropped out of the sky. And this impossible thing. It's th these are people we know. Mm -hmm. These are our neighbors. These are mm -hmm. our people in our families. These are our colleagues. So there's a lot of stigma and shame on the male side of it as well. Not enough to make them stop, mm -hmm. obviously. Mm -hmm. But, there's, but, but it stops them from saying, hey, I'm that guy who does that thing. And the rage that they talked about, I find is really interesting, is that the rage is un uncontrollable when it comes to her. Because I asked one of the guys, I was like, so this rage that you keep talking about when you feel humiliated and shamed by somebody, I said, you know, your boss treats you badly, somebody looks at you funny or speaks to you or insults you. Are you able to control your rage? I said, do you, do you beat your boss? To death? Do you do that? No, no, no. No, I don't do that. Okay, so you have self-control. It's just with her somehow, there's no control on, on your intensity of that force. Yeah. Let's go back to something you just talked about, namely this <clears throat> wish to be a king yeah. in your own house. Here, finally, you yeah. have some sort of power. Yeah. In Norway, but I know in many other countries as well, and even in a film that you made some years ago, but now it's a yeah. love story, yeah. we talk about adestrap or honors killing, that yeah. this is actually something that also maintains your honor. Sometimes we discuss that as a cultural issue, yeah. but also as a broader issue of what it means to be a man. Uh, you have engaged in exactly this debate in Norway. How do we talk about this? What do we do about this? Is this a big problem in Norway? Uh, yes uh, and no. Because uh, I think, um, um, uh, sorry, my English is not as no. dull as uh, Diaz, but <laughs> going I, I, very well. I think that the police and the society sometimes address um, regular partner killing as uh, adestrap and as uh, adestrap as regular partner killing. So they misjudge it a lot of times too. But it happens, and and it often has to do with the, you know the structure is there. Uh, that's why we call it gender violence, uh, yeah. and that's why women are mostly affected. But the structure is also there in both minority, but also in the majority society. Yeah, you perhaps. have seen issues in the ethnic Norwegian society where this, uh, I hate the word uh, adestrap because it's no honor in it. <laughs> uh, and, uh, but but uh, it happens uh, in the ethnic Norwegian uh, communities too, but it's not as well addressed and yeah. you, and it's, and it's often, it's like when you have a Muslim terrorist, it's religion, if it's white, he's got mental issues, you know? So when it's, I'm sorry, <laughs> it is true. like that. Yeah. And, yeah. and when you have a Norwegian man killing both him, himself, his uh, wife, ex-wife, and the kids in a burning house, for example, uh, a, a pretty recent example, then you don't talk about it as adestrap. You yeah. just say it was a family tragedy. Yeah. So my point is, it happens a lot more often than we like to address it in our society. Mm. And, and the reality is, like you're saying, you, know, you can call it this special name or that special name, at the, at the heart of it, it is, it's, you know, it's, it's violence against women, it's gender-based violence. The reason why sometimes these terms are important, or have become important, at least mm. in the UK, is specifically when we're looking at you know, so-called honor killings, is the, the, the perpetrator and the, the scope of the perpetration and who knows and, and what the, who you need to be looking at is different than just the husband. Mm. So that's usually some, at least mm. in the UK, why the police started using that term was to differentiate it a little bit. The end result is the same. Mm. When I made the Banas film, actually, I had a huge argument with, with, with a friend of mine because he was like, oh, it's really terrible what they do, isn't it? I was like, what do you mean that they do? He said, oh, you know, the, you know, certain communities, you know, they treat their women like this and they kill them and they blah. And I just looked at him and I was like, you don't kill your women? Mm. You have like four women killed every week in the UK. Mm -hmm. that, well, that's not the same. I said, look, a dead woman's a dead woman. Mm -hmm. Are you telling me she's any less dead than her? Mm -hmm. So yes, so, the, so I would say the context and the justifications that people tell themselves, the story they have to tell themselves might differ and there's some you know, variation there. Mm -hmm. but, the, but the bottom line is women are treated as property, yes. women are treated as a, a punching bag for somebody's anger, mm -hmm. for somebody's uh, lack of self-respect, lack of self, uh, whatever it is. 
That's the point, mm -hmm. is it all falls on her in every culture. Mm -hmm. And that has to stop and that has to be examined mm -hmm. because there's something going on here mm -hmm. that is consistent and is universal mm -hmm. and is not okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so we are now saying this is, as we all know from the media, a real problem. It's a problem we don't talk about enough. It's yeah. a problem that many women feel it is hard to raise, but also among men. In these countries, in countries like Norway, it's harder for white women to come out and say, this is happening to me. Yeah. Precisely because women are doing so much better in mm -hmm. principle and all kind of measuring factors. In this country, it's much harder for, for white Norwegian women to come out and say, but this happens to me. I know I'm educated and I know I make this kind of money mm. and whatever, but this still happens to me. Mm. Yeah. And the, the woman I talked to, the, the blonde lady that you saw in there, she's like a Harvard, Harvard educated, mm. really successful woman. I wanted to include her on purpose in the film so people could see. It's not a socioeconomic thing. She said to me, she said, until it happened to me, I thought this is just what happens to women of color, yeah. or this is just what mm. happens to immigrant women. Mm. It's not true, mm. it happens everywhere. So you're absolutely right. So let's, uh, I'll just ask you one question, because this is something that has also been discussed quite uh, widely uh, in the recent months here in Norway. Namely, what can we do when it comes to very concrete things? Should the police do more? Should we have more violence alarms of various sorts? That was, of course, one of the major issues discussed after what happened tragically at Elverum. So as an acting politician, what do you see that we can do more of to actually avoid this, which of course doesn't address the cultural issue. Yeah. Yeah. But we also have to discuss mm, the very practical issues Absolutely. of what our institutions can do. Yeah. Mm. Of course, we need more of the violence alarm and, uh, and the reverse violence yeah. around. Yeah. Is that the word? <laughs> yeah, I think it is. Uh, yes, and we have proposed it and put the money on the table and it's coming. So I'm, I'm very happy for that. But at the same time, when you have to get yourself a alarm like that, it's already too late. You're already living in fear. You're already living in a way that you don't want for yourself or your kids uh, in many situations. So I think that we have to attack this, and that's what we're not doing yeah. as a society. And I, I love that you're addressing it in your documentary, that this is a structural problem. Yeah. The where do you attack it is all, it's, it's it's both about how women are in the society, but it's also how we treat our men, our boys, how we practice to disagree in the classroom, how we practice to uh, prioritize our mental health, how we talk about it. We don't do that enough. It's, it's, um, it's, it's such a new science to, to address our mental health that, uh, that way. So I think it's about the structures. It's also about the police. Uh, here in the audience, we have Ostri, who is one of the head of the, uh, the police's uh, most important department within this field. Uh, we need them to expand to the whole police. Uh, actually, when I call around, and I, uh, when I worked as a justice politician, and, and I visited uh, police offices uh, around the Norway, and they said to me that it's not status in working with gender violence. So we have to make it great again to work with it and make sure that you prioritize it and we need an astri in all of norway uh, and and then we need to focus on the prisons i loved what you said about uh, uh, mandated um, uh, different courses to to uh, address and work with your issues uh, i think that we don't talk enough about prisons what kind of treatment do you get in prisons today? Mm. Prison is just a place you go in and you go out. And you're in your room and, and many people kill themselves. It's, mm. it's not good. So we need to, um, even though we don't like the people in prisons because they hurt someone before they got there, they cannot come out as they got in. Yeah. So we need to invest in them too with all those um, equipments you, you talked about. Mm. Do you recognize what the Kamsi is saying here from the context that you've worked in? that we're not doing enough, that the police is not doing enough, that we're not doing enough in the prisons? So I don't know enough about the Norwegian specifics mm. Uh, mm. because my experience is more in the UK and in the US. Uh, in the UK context, yes. I mean, you know, the very first film I made was this young woman who went to the police in London five times and was not believed. So she ended up dead because of that, mm. because she wasn't believed. So. Um, I think the police, you know, in terms of the training that police get has to be improved in, in those contexts. I don't know how good or bad it is here. Uh, I think that um, 
But I think that the cultural part is where we always drop. I think we always, we, we, so many women's groups are doing such amazing work, and some of them are here, who are doing some really important work in terms of raise, raising awareness, making sure, holding the various systems to account and ensuring that they receive the training that they need, and also ensuring that women are protected and get the support and the community that they also need. Mm -hmm. Because women are so isolated and so sort of, well, they're hidden away, some of them, and how are they supposed to talking about mental health? Are they supposed to survive a, a life after that kind of abuse themselves? Mm -hmm. But I think, so all of those aspects are very important, and how do we deal with the children of mm -hmm. women and parents that have uh, exercised violence like that? Mm -hmm. But I think the cultural component, we have to take hold of even more. That I don't think we're doing enough of. I do know enough about Norway, I pay enough attention mm -hmm. to Norway to see that that piece we're not doing enough about. Mm -hmm. And then we come back to the question of the schools that we talked yeah, about earlier, absolutely. starting early on. And yeah, it's not only to. about the gender issue per se, it's also about violence. Yeah. It's also about how we consume culture, what are seen as ideals in yeah. uh, our lives. Um, and I'd like to come back, therefore, to what you said earlier about pornography, which we can expand to the whole field yeah, yeah. of entertainment. Uh, yeah, to put yeah. the question quite yeah. simply, yeah. is there too much violence out there that young people are yeah. uh, confronting, meeting, just consuming mm. every day? Well, look at what we're doing in the world. Look at what's happening right now. Mm. I mean, just look around the world in all the different corners. What are we doing? Mm. We're just using violence. Mm. And then in the next breath, we're going to say, ah, oh, but like, don't get me started. <laughs> I just did. <laughs> you just did. And I've almost lost my voice. But, but you know, I mean, you know, on one hand, we say to children, don't hit, use your words, don't do this, don't do that. And then we've got political leaders who are taking or ordering the taking of life themselves, you know. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, and we're constantly plastering it on our TV, on our social media. So, you know, we've got to pick something. We've got to pick a stand that we can actually stand by and then stick to it. So yes, there is too much violence. Yes, there is too much dehumanization. And there is too much dehumanization also of ourselves. Yeah. And I think we're not making it okay for young people to talk and to ask questions and to challenge and to say uncomfortable things and to ask us uncomfortable things. Yeah. Um, and, and just because they don't ask us doesn't mean that they don't have the questions. Mm -hmm. They just take them somewhere else, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. But yes, we have way too much violence around mm -hmm. us. Mm -hmm. Mm. I think. And of course, we are now in the house that celebrates the Nobel yeah. Peace Prize. Yeah. And as a former member of the committee and still active in Nobel circles, I would also say, not being a pacifist myself, but that we don't talk enough about peace. We don't. We don't. In the world, All the films uh, I do are about violence. <laughs> but they are, they of course, are. about it because you want but to address it. But they are because it. I'm looking for the solution. How do we interrupt it? Mm. How do we... Because, you know, people keep thinking, oh, is extremism, yeah. is that what you're doing? And it, yes, I'm, I'm dealing with, I'm trying to... My obsession with violence, I think, is... It's preventable. Yeah. That's, that's like... Yeah made yeah. by us. Mm. We can actually do something about that. We can reduce it. Yeah. So whether it's public violence like terrorism or, or all the other forms that I've looked at or political violence of various forms, or it's this type of private violence that happens, or the next project that I'm working on, which is uh, you know, looking at all the violence I've covered so far is looking at sort of the, the unacceptable forms of violence. Yeah. But now I'm looking at the acceptable quote unquote form of violence, yes. which is looking at war veterans. Mm. Uh, from the post 9-11 wars, what does engaging in that kind of violence do to the person who's mm. engaged in it? Yeah. So we have to find ways where we can interrupt it, where we can find ways where we can hold on to another part of ourselves yeah. and not just give everything away to violence no. and accept it like it's natural. And of course, dialogue is a crucial is part the of that. Before our yeah. last part of this uh, conversation, I'd like to ask you, Kamsi, when you hear what Dia is doing, when you see her films, one of the things she is doing is talking to the people you just talked about that we don't like in the <laughs> sense they're in prisons. Yeah. They have been violent. We want to say, on the basis of principle, we don't like what you did. What she does is actually talk to them and even become their friend or at least mm. engage in friendly conversation. What's your reaction when you see Dia doing that in her films? I like that. <laughs> uh, well, uh, seriously though, um, uh, I think that um, as individuals, of course, you hate that guy who raped your friend. You hate that person who 
kick your mom. Of course you do that on an individual level. But as a politician, as a state, we have to be better. We have to make all those second, third, and fourth chances because we can't just fill up the prisons with people. That's not an option. Look at the US yeah. and how well is that going? Yeah, yeah. it doesn't work. Yeah. So you have to treat people as people because I will hate someone because they did some harm to someone I know, but as institutions, we need to be better and make sure they get new chances because we don't want to fill up our prisons. We actually want them to be better. And, and the alternative is, like you said, new violence, yeah. new yeah. rounds of it. And I think this is the right house to talk about exactly that. Uh, one of the people I had the privilege of being with and discussing with was Juan Manuel Santos, president of Colombia. Yeah. And he told the story of how he started talking to the FARC when everyone around him said, you can't talk to them because they're evil. We have to fight them. And he said, but I want to sit down and ask them, what sort of Colombia do you want to see yes. 20 years from now? That was the start yes. of one of the more successful peace processes we have, been, we have seen. Uh, so I think this is the house to talk about this. Um, yeah. You may find that this is a discussion on gender that doesn't have gender balance. <laughs> so we'll be doing something about that right now because it's my pleasure to welcome up on stage Adam Nyo. Please come up. Adam is uh, studying for uh, the psychology degree, professional study in psychology, and I'm of course extremely happy to say that on the side he also studies philosophy. Oh, fantastic. And we have yeah. a common love of Plato. <laughs> well, before I ask you some questions, because you have written some really interesting things about that, we'll now see a short one minute film which introduces a name that none of us up here like, well, maybe we like the name, but not the person behind it. But once again, confronting what we're actually talking about, the name is Andrew Tate. And let's look at this little news clip. The Matrix has attacked me. He's called himself the king of toxic masculinity, but now controversial influencer Andrew Tate has been arrested in Romania. Here is everything you need to know. Raised in Luton, Andrew Tate was a professional kickboxer. He was cast in Big Brother in 2016, but was ejected from the house after a video emerged of him appearing to attack a woman with a belt, something he denies. Tate started to gain notoriety for his controversial and misogynistic posts on social media, once suggesting women bear some responsibility for being raped. He has denied holding misogynistic views, but has also described himself as the king of toxic masculinity. His views and the backlash he faced led to him gaining a larger audience and adoring supporters. He was eventually banned from Twitter, but this didn't stop him. He is allowed back on the app in November 2022. Tate was also banned from Facebook, Instagram, YouTube and TikTok, but his content is still being shared. The hashtag Andrew Tate on TikTok has been viewed billions of times, with many worrying about his influence over young people online. I think we can all agree that he represents a sort of, uh, well, you said you didn't like the term toxic masculinity, and I can see why. But on the other hand, there is something toxic about what he represents and the way he inspires others. Mm. At the same time, are there things we are not addressing when it comes to being a male in our society, and you wrote a very well-written and much reacted to uh, chronique op-ed at NRK Yttering uh, last summer called uh, Men i Daberland. Uh, tell us briefly, what's your challenge to us, not least as someone who takes not just the psychological and social, but also biological preconditions of being a man, uh, seriously? Yeah, well, I think my first reaction when I see this is that I think that this reflects a kind of um, failure in our society, a, a kind of yeah. lack for a um, positive masculine role that might integrate um, mm. our instincts, which is, I think, the function of culture in a pro-social way. And I think um, the cause of this is that we have uh, tried to sort of ignore um, the nature aspect of the gender discussion in, in an attempt to sort of promote equality, but I think uh, that it might um, in effect cause the opposite because then we fail to address the things which actually are different. And I think uh, this is um, very apparent in, in uh, 
partner violence because I think that if we suppose that there might be an, a sort of um, partnership on equal terms between men and women, then we are actually neglecting the fact that there is a huge power difference between men and women, and, and that's just not tenable because then we're not actually um, taking the problem seriously. And I think um, the problem, which is the sort of male problem, is that um, if we just look at the statistics of, of all kinds of war and criminality and extreme ideology, then it's just a huge trend that there's just a lot of men there mostly men actually, it's like the, the fascists in Italy, and Nazism, all the, the black shirts and the brown shirts, those, those were discontent men for the most part and, and usually war veterans who felt the kind of humiliation over the last First World War. And I think um, the, the trends that we are producing in our society uh, today with, with growing inequality um, in terms of economics and also um, in terms of um, partnership the fact that there's a lot of men who are unable to get a partner it should worry us intensely because then we're uh, creating a sort of uh, population in the West of uh, discontent men who in fact have no mm, realistic means of having children. And I think from an evolutionary perspective, we have to remember that we are fundamentally evolved to survive and reproduce. And I think it might be dangerous to neglect the fact that that's so hardwired into us that that might uh, create some extremist reactions if those motives are not able to be met in some kind of reasonable way. Mm, mm. Um, yeah. So what you are saying then, uh, using an evolutionary perspective, but I think you can use a more general philosophical or even theological perspective, you know, there are certain things about being a human being and then being a man uh, that are challenging, hard, and you are saying that we are not doing a good enough job in our society of addressing that and being conscious of the fact that it can be hard to be a man, to put it in simple words, in our sort of society. That's yeah, yeah, and also I think um, it's hard to be a human in general, but I think, uh, and this is a central point in, 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 in psychoanalysis from Sigmund Freud, who wrote uh, the Civilizations and its Discontents, where he basically supposes that there is this conflict between um, our internal evolved drives, sort of, sort of sexual motives and aggression and jealousy and, and, and so on, which aren't uh, exactly, uh, it doesn't really harmonize with, uh, with civilized society. And so we have to sort of repress them in some way. And the result is uh, stress, neurosis, uh, that, 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 that sort of internal conflict, that's why we called it psychodynamics. And I think um, a problem today is that we have, um, evolved into a really sort of small pocket of peace in the sort of world history that has encouraged a sort of, um, I, I would say, a, a kind of repression of our, perhaps, the, the darker sides of human psychology, which most certainly are there. And I think uh, this consciousness has been there in previous times in, in, uh, in, in Christian theology, as we talked about, yeah. with concepts such as the original sin, which supposes that we are all sinful in some kind of way, that, that we all do things that we want instead of what we ought, and that we somehow need to make uh, amends for that and try to become better and strive to become better. And I think what happens today is that somewhere along the line of, of, of sort of market liberalized, uh, liberalizing uh, processes and, and sort of anti-traditionalism, we, we stopped uh, as a culture to uh, cultivating the best human properties and started to, to sort of market things that um, appeal to, to perhaps the, the worst sides of us. And I think that's really apparent in, in say, pornography, but also in, in mass media and, and sort of action yeah. movie culture, Pop which culture, uh, yeah. um, yeah. normalizes sort of destructive aspects of our psychology, which is not healthy in a long-term perspective. Mm, mm, thank you. Just remind you on the terminology. Someone said when he heard the term original sin, he thought it was a sin you hadn't heard of before. Like, oh, <laughs> that's an original sin. Yeah. And a Catholic friend of mine said, no, they've heard them all. They've, yeah. <laughs> uh, but they've it's, of course, there. you know, the idea that there's something <clears throat> there. Uh, and this is part of a larger debate that uh, has been uh, quite useful, I think, over the last almost a year in Norway. And you have contributed to that. Uh, with many views back and forth. Leah, tell us, when you uh, read what Adam uh, writes or you hear what he's saying now mm. on the challenges of uh, gender, 
generally, yeah. and of being a man. How do you react? So I, I really appreciate you bringing up everything you've brought up. Uh, I think it's incredibly important, and I think it's one of the conversations that we're not having, actually. <clears throat> it's why I think so many young men are flocking to less uh, or more destructive, I should say, ways of addressing some of this and seeking the answers for a lot of this. Uh, my experience in having filmed uh, severely uh, what they would consider traditionally masculine, very violent, aggressive men, uh, what I have found time and time and time again is a brokenness that was not satisfied by being this hyper-masculine expression. So, because I, I know there's a lot of arguments around, you know, are men being feminized? Is it, you know, are men yeah. being too, becoming too docile because women are becoming too uh, equal or dominant or mm -hmm. whatever the perception might be? So if I only look at those kind of hyper-tough guys, that's been my very, very consistent experience across cultures, across uh, uh, forms of violence as well, is that, and the brokenness came more from, like you're saying, kind of an inner, Maybe an inner darkness, I don't know. It, to me, it felt more like an inner lack, an inner kind of sorrow, uh, an inner sorrow about not being able to be fully human, and that the expression of being a full human being wasn't extended or experienced in this very hyper-masculine form, that there was no place for them to be hurt. Yeah. There was no place yeah. for them to... I'm not saying, oh, boys should cry, they should, but that's, that's, I'm not trying to make it that simple, even though it actually is in some ways, but the, the, they felt like the, the, the lane, in a way, within which for them to be a human being was so narrow that aggression and violence were the most acceptable ways for them to be, that it robbed them of their own humanity. They weren't allowed to have contradictory feelings or to have feelings and to express those feelings in a way that didn't come out as those two forms. So that's been my experience. Um, I would say of, of those types of kind of archetypes, those types of men. Um, what, what I would say is that I think uh, with, we have a huge backlash against women's rights. Yeah in the world right now and, 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 and around feminism. The time that we're living in right now and the positions that women have uh, accomplished I in our societies, I mean, this is, this is new. Mm. It's, it's not the original sin, but this is original. This yeah. hasn't happened yeah. before, yeah. you know? And it's hard, yeah. it's hard. So even though many of us are finding our place and going, yes, I get to finally be fully me now and I get to have opportunities, and I get to participate and contribute and be counted as a counter to that and as a backlash to that, I think some people, some men feel left out and yep. feel left behind and feel dislocated. Like what is so, if you, if you have this position now, then where does that put me, right? Mm -hmm. how, how do I be a man in, in that kind of a context. What can I do? What can I not do? I've talked to some of my friends who are like, oh, is it okay for me to hold the door open for women now? Like, or is that like rude now? Like, what, are, like, and it's, it's, some of my friends laughed at it, but like, it's, it's a, like actually a sincere question. Yeah. So there is a deep, honest, real sense of dislocation yeah. Yeah. experienced by a lot of young people, a, a lot of young men, I think. Yeah. I think you know we're seeing a wave of across the world male suicide yeah. and a mental health crisis. There's something very profoundly important going on. Yeah. I, I think if I'm understanding your, you correctly, you, you're saying that that's more because of certain biological urges or predispositions not getting to express themselves, and that's why maybe is, is what I'm hearing. For, for me, what I've seen and what I've heard time and time and time and time again, having interviewed so many of these guys, is, is that it is that suffocation of their humanity combined with not knowing. So how, how do I be a man? How do I be a boy? How do I be a good partner? How do I be a partner that's appealing? And unfortunately, Andrew Tate is giving these horrific yeah. answers 
clearly not knowing what women actually want. Mm. Yeah? Mm. So maybe, the, so, you know, part of the question needs to be what I was trying to say earlier. What does a healthy relationship look like? What is, a, what, what is good for you? What is good for me? How do we find that? And how do we do that in a way that's not hurtful to me and that's not, doesn't diminish you and makes you feel like you don't matter, you do matter as mm. well. And I think, um, so I think some of this we need to talk about. But one other thing I think is also very important to talk about uh, is there cannot be a sense of entitlement, yeah? There, there is no entitlement or right to sex or, or entitlement to a woman's body. So, so, but I think sex is available. You just have to not do it like he does it. <laughs> and, 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 and a lot of the young men who are looking for companionship and partnership and intimacy, they can't find it. You just have to do it in a way that keeps her dignity and his dignity both in the same place, mm -hmm. as human beings first. Mm -hmm. We are human beings first, not man and woman first, we are human being first, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So if we start there, and we start with, we want to be together, and we, we, we want to share something together, then we figure out, okay, well then how do we do that? Mm -hmm. Is what I think, but, yeah. I, but anyway, that's a, Thank you. It's, and it's a very useful conversation because we see several ways of feeling left out, left behind. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and it's but, legitimate. It's sincere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We have and to listen important. to those voices. And it's important. We need to take it seriously. But, but let's um, go back to this uh, year's, or rather last year's Nobel Peace Prize, the one that yeah. we are um, yeah. taking as a point of departure for our discussion here, Narjis Mohammadi. And uh, the sense that many of the hard-won victories of uh, the women's movement are being lost. Absolutely. And of course, that's the exact same impression we have in Iran, because that was a country where many yeah. rights were won, not maybe to the degree we find them here, but nonetheless, a much larger extent of women taking part in society, of getting an education, of being taken seriously, and then yeah. a sort of rollback <coughs> that we hadn't really expected, and it's happening in many places. Yeah. Uh, so, Kamsi, as someone who observes Norwegian society as a politician, you see both of these sides, both the challenge, at least, to some of these things that we look upon as the core part mm. of women's safety, security, and rights, and at the same time, yeah. Adam's point, that it's hard in that sort of society also to find your place as a man. Mm. Yeah. And that's why you have to <laughs> have reforms and not revolution. You yeah. have to take it step mm. by step. It's, um, 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 I know where I want to go as a politician. I know what kind of society I want. We want gender equality. We want all of these structural um, um, changes yeah. for the future. But at the same time, you cannot leave people behind when you have these transitions. That's why you need it step by step. You can't just go ahead and do as you, do as you please. Mm. Uh, but you know, many people ask me, like, um, when you fight for gender equality, when you uh, fight for minority representation and different representations, mm. do anyone have to lose, people mm -hmm. ask me. And, and many often I hear other people say, no, nobody has to lose, you know, it's a win-win. That's just, that's bullshit. That's not true. Yeah, yeah. because... You heard it here. <laughs> because, it's, say, you have a board, you have 10 seats. If you want gender equality, 50-50, uh, some men has to leave for women to enter. Yeah. That, mm. That's the society in a nutshell, okay? And that is the goal. But it's also about how we speak of it. Yeah and how we address the competence, what we want around the board table, you know? So I think that the transition, it's difficult, but necessary. And then you have to take all the measurement to make sure the transition is happening. Mm -hmm. I will never um, accept the premises that it, it, this, these transitions are hard and thereby not necessary. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, uh, mm. It will be the most, um, um, that would be dangerous. Yeah, yeah. So, so I think that um, we should have our, you know, um, our common goal for where we want to go. Yeah. But at the same time, have the respect 
uh, even if we speak about in the classroom or in the prison or, or in, in our daily life, how we address people, how we talk about people, the transitions is what we need to respect, how to make sure everyone is the part of it yeah. and we're not leaving anyone behind. Because obviously, I mean, there aren't always win-wins and you, I think you formulate it very clearly. And at the same time, you don't want losers in the sense that people don't feel they are respected. I mean, I've discussed yeah. this a lot with people in enterprises that have to fire people. Yeah. And the good people in HR, as we call it these days, are yeah. the people who are thinking the following. I want this person I'm firing now, 10 years from now, to look back at that moment and say, I was treated with respect. Yes. I was treated mm. as someone who was spoken to, yes. who was taken care of. There was a transition. And this yes. is possible. It is. So in many ways, we're talking about that yeah. here as well. But Adam, I'd like to ask you, and I know it's now 7 o'clock, but we'll go a little bit over time, if that's okay, <laughs> just 10 minutes max. Uh, but Adam, you, uh, of course, became part of this debate last year, and I'm sure you've gotten reactions. You just hear some here now. What are the reactions that you have received that you're most happy about, where you go, yes, this is what I wanted to say, or this is an interesting reaction to your uh, message? Hmm. Yeah, well, I think um, there was a lot of, well, both a lot of young men, older men, uh, but also, quite interestingly, uh, there was a lot of mothers who had sons who said uh, thank you for, for, for uh, speaking about these things because they had their, they were worried about their sons and they had and they saw these differences really clearly uh, if, if they had uh, maybe a daughter as well that there is some kind of clear difference in a way a kind of um, I don't know restlessness or, or whatever and I think we're seeing this in the in the educational systems quite clearly that uh, mm. young boys are they, they, they just won't sit still when they're young. And I think in, in a sort of historical context, it's not really natural to suppose that a young boy should sit still uh, uh, for eight hours a day. I mean, it's, it's unprecedented in history. Um, and so um, I think that, that there, uh, there really is a need to take these issues more seriously than we have. Um, yeah, yeah. And I mean, uh, speaking <coughs> as someone who's in his mid-50s, <laughs> plus two, uh, <laughs> Uh, I, I grew up in the 70s and 80s, and in many ways that was a relatively calm time for these kinds of things. Lots of things happened, but generally we thought, hey, it's about letting the girls play football as well. Yeah. And it's about letting the guys knit. That's perfectly fine. <laughs> and we all thought, well, this is going in the right direction. This yeah. is, you know, there are some problems here. We discuss abortion limits there. There are issues to solve. Yeah. But we still felt that this was going relatively well. And it's interesting when it comes to the research that Chashti pointed to where it turns out that it's actually younger men more often who feel these questions are really problematic. Because I, I think too many men my age think, well, is this really a problem? Isn't this going well? And we realize, no, it's, it's not. not. There are issues we aren't addressing as reflected by the mothers who came back to you. Hmm. So Dia, tell us, how do you feel that the sort of conversations you are starting, the sort of dialogues that you are actually showing us are possible, yeah. are they one of the things that we need to do more of in our society, having these sorts of very, sometimes uncomfortable, but important conversations. Absolutely. Yeah. I think it's, it's completely, or it's absent. I'm sure it's happening a little bit, but it's, it's absent in a real, serious, consistent way. We need it. If, and, and I think the consequences of us not having these conversations is we're going to continue to see attacks on women's rights. And, and, and minority rights and anyone, anyone that comes from marginalized groups and whatever little progress that they've managed to make. I think it's going to get rolled back. I think we're going to see waves of these populist, uh, uh, the, the way, way this kind of populist politics is also weaponizing some of these issues, some of these emotional and cultural issues. I think we're going to see that happening more and more. And, and I think people are just going to keep retreating into their corners. Um, it, one of the things that I was just reminded of that you used, one of the things you said earlier, is when I was filming with the neo-Nazis, I remember they said to me, uh, oh yeah, so you're Muslim and blah, blah, all this kind of stuff, and uh, anyway, and kind of all kinds of obnoxious stuff. But then one of the things he said, he's like, you know what I really respect is what we want is we want white Sharia. And I went, huh? <laughs> what does that mean? And he's like, we want to do what you people do to your women. We want our women to be like that. 
We want our women to be subservient. We want, or like whatever image that yeah, he'd made yeah. in his brain, yeah? yeah? So it's interesting, and he was super serious about it. And you know, and Tate's saying his version of that, right? Yeah. So like you were, Kamsi, you were saying, the reality is it's not gonna go back to the way things used to be. People will try, but it's not going to back, go back to it. And some people, wh when new things happen, and old, old ways are, just because something is old doesn't mean that it was a good thing. Yeah. Just because something used to happen doesn't mean that it needs to continue to happen. Yeah. I think what needs to happen is we need to have more conversations about this and we need, they need to happen often and they need to have it at every level of our society, from our kitchen tables to our politicians, to our media, to any forums like this, but most importantly also in our schools. But I think that I think we have to have to acknowledge that there is something very real going on here. Yeah. But we also have to acknowledge that just because somebody loses, I, I know I keep talking about little kids, it's because I've got little kids, so like all my examples seem to be around that now. Mm -hmm. Just because one child has something and used to have something, I have an older child and now I have a baby, and she's, she feels entitled to me. She feels entitled to everything. In, in her mm. life, because that's what she's used to. Mm. But there's another child now. Yeah. She has to be considerate of that child. And we're going through tremendous growing pains right now. She's, this is being filmed, she's gonna watch it. I'm really sorry <laughs> to bring up your stuff, but at age six. But, but you know, it's not a matter of you lose yeah. and this child wins. Mm. It's teaching them, this is how you share. Mm. You have it a little bit, then you have it. Sometimes she has it, maybe you don't have it, maybe you get something else. So I know that makes it sound, I, I don't intend that as a patronizing no, way no. of explaining it. I really intend it as, it's as basic as that. Yep. And that's the kind of intention we as a society need to have yep. towards our sons and daughters. They are our sons and daughters. And we have to help them function. And we cannot let them only to their own devices to go figure things out. Yep. And then one is harming themselves, one is har harming each other, and, you know, and, or spilling into violence. We have to help them. Yeah. And it's about sharing, and it's about we have to be together. Yeah. And, and I don't get to dominate you. Yeah. I don't get to be better than you. Sometimes I'm better than you, sometimes you're better than me. It's okay. And to be comfortable in your own skin, and in your own mm. body, mm. and in your own darkness, we also have to talk about. And that darkness is not just present in men, it's present in all of us. Yeah. But we have to learn how to live with it, how to manage around it, and how we deal with our traumas, how we deal with our insides, how we, how we live that out loud out here in a way that isn't destructive. It's so important, you know? And, and acknowledging the limits of entitlement. Yeah. I think yeah. that's a really core really idea important. here. Because that doesn't mean that you aren't entitled to anything, no. but that we have to share. I mean, yeah. Adam and I both love ancient philosophy and think there are things to learn from that. And I think Aristotle's ideal for the good political society, which is one where those who rule don't always rule. You share in ruling, exactly. and sometimes you give away rule, yes. just like Norwegian politicians do when they give away the key or the key card, or the fingerprint, or whatever it is now. Uh, it's my favorite day, always, when we have changed the government. Not necessarily because I voted for the incoming one, yeah. but because it's a sign yes. that we share, we share in this. And that's what life is. Yeah. We, everybody has to take turns yeah. in everything that we do. Yeah. Whether it's in a company, or it's in school, or it's in... It's natural. Yeah. I, I know we want to say that certain things are natural because you're male, or you're female, mm. or you're... But, but actually taking yeah. turns and cooperation yeah. is what has secured our existence yeah. and our progress. Yeah. So that's what we have to, that mm. and I, 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 we have to, when it comes to the masculinity part of it, we have to reimagine what it means mm. to be a man, what it means to be a modern human being yeah. with AI, with social media, with, with, with rising inequality. I completely agree with you. You know, with all these various challenges that we're up against, how do we do that? Yeah. We do it together. Yeah. We don't do it in the old way, we do it in a new way, together, that includes you and it includes me, and it includes somebody who looks like him and looks like you. Because it's gonna take everybody to, to resolve it. Mm. So that's, we have to practice that, yeah. Yeah. rather than nobody used to be like this. Yeah. It did, and it served this purpose. And now the challenges are what they are. 
And now we need to be creative and imaginative and be able to see there is a future that has place for all of us. Yeah. And that's what we have to commit to, I think. Yeah. The antidote to violence is exactly what you're talking about. Before we end, I have to ask you one question, Kamsi, because we've all agreed now that this is not something limited to one culture, mm. one ethnicity. Mm. But at the same time, there is a real debate in Norway about exactly what we're talking about here, opening up these rooms for dialogue, talking about gender roles, talking about basic rights. Yeah. How do we get into some of the minority cultures in Norway that also we need to address? And we're not saying this now because we think they don't care about these things, but we also know that it's harder. It can have to do with language. Mm. Uh, it can have to do with simply these are conversations we haven't had before. So as a politician, how do you tackle that? How do you feel that we can better address this so all of society takes part in this conversation? Uh, the most important thing, and I'm trying to say this to all my political colleagues, both within my parties and other parties, is that when you want to talk about, for example, gender equality, then talk about gender equality as a universal value, period. Yeah. The second you, you talk to someone in the mosque or a temple or whatever, and you say, this is a Norwegian value, mm. Mm. then why should I listen to you? No? So I think the most important thing we do uh, in our political platforms, yeah. in our dialogue, in how we speak, this is a universal value. Mm. And we want everyone to practice it because it's a common goal. We want to do that. So every time someone says, Norwegian values, like yeah. freedom of speech and gender equality, I'm like, when did it become a Norwegian value? 1814? Like, you know, it's, uh, <laughs> let's, let's talk about this stuff as a universal value. That's what I want, and I think that's the, that's the key to the road. Yeah, thank you. And Adam, let me finish with a question to you. You're a student. You spend your time in, cycle, in, in academic circles with yeah. psychologists, philosophers. And then you are now taking part in this societal debate. Do you feel that other academics, fellow students, teachers, are they interested in, or should they be more interested in, taking part in these conversations? Well, yeah, absolutely. I think it's a civic responsibility for, for academia, and I think that's a responsibility that a lot of academics are failing at this moment. And I think that has to do with concrete things in university politics, where we try to promote more publications than um, other kinds of engagement. And I think it's a narrowing of what the, the civic duty of the institution is. Um, because I think, <clears throat> as following Plato and Aristotle again, that I think that we need good leaders with knowledge to, to sort of promote good social uh, change. If, if not, then our debates are gonna remain on a sort of superficial, polarized level where we really don't talk about the fundamental issues, but uh, just front our narratives to the group that we belong to. And I think that's uh, intrinsically dysfunctional because it's not a debate at all. It's just an exchange of superficial stories. Um, and I think it's a wonderful reminder here in this house because obviously what the Nobel Peace Center tries to do is to engage in exactly these sorts of debates, to open them up. I remember they used to say in my academic field that the average readership of an academic article is seven. <coughs> that includes yourself and your mother. I'm not sure that's quite true, but still, uh, we need to open this up, which is what the Nobel Peace Center does. And I think also echoing what Dia and Kamsi said here, uh, when we handed out the Nobel Peace Prize on the 10th of December in 2023. We did that on the 75th anniversary of the signing of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And of course, that starts the first article after the preamble with talking about the human family yeah. and talking about inherent dignity as a global value. And I think we need to talk more about that today. That doesn't mean that culture is not important. That doesn't mean that we cannot celebrate our different cultures that we can have this sort of conversation based in what we call universal values. So what I'd like to do is to thank sincerely everyone at the Nobel Peace Center. They are just lovely, lovely people to work with. Yes. They do so much to engage in these sorts of dialogues and engage us in them. Uh, so the final applause that we'll have now will of course be for our three wonderful people here. 
the honor we have of having you visit us here in Norway. Come back more often. We have better <laughs> weather other times of year. Uh, 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 but the applause also includes our great friends at the Nobel Peace Center. Yeah. Thanks to each and every one of you. And thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.